I started writing software back in 1983. Could you work for $8 an hour and do what you just did? I was like, I would love to. And that's how I got my first job as a software developer. She pulled out a fistful of parking tickets and said, if you guys made an app to pay for parking, I would use it every day. Our eyes just lit up like, well, clearly we can make that. I mean, to be honest, the, the point where we were like, we should probably take this serious is when we were accepted Y Combinator. He was working behind the counter he cracked a JavaScript joke. I hired him. I personally have a strong conviction to helping other black founders at least catch up to where I am. I want people to make parking so easy that no one ever gets another parking ticket. What's up, Unfound Nation? Dan Kihanya here. Thanks so much for listening in to another episode of Founders Unfound. That was Jim Gibbs, co-founder and CEO of Meter Feeder, a company that predicts parking availability and enables vehicles to pay for parking with no human interaction. Basically, cars pay for themselves. Jim and I actually both did some work with a well-known local Pittsburgh tech company called Branding Brand. So I was excited when we recently reconnected this year. Jim is a brilliant coder and a visionary, and he's out to convince us all that it isn't even a question. Pittsburgh is the place to be. Make sure to listen in to learn how this guy, who's done development for the likes of USA Today and American Eagle, set out to reimagine the parking meter. Our episode is sponsored by The Plug. The Plug is a one-of-a-kind place to find research, stories, and data relevant about and for the black tech landscape. They have unique reports and analysis and members-only calls with some of today's premier thought leaders. Use the code UNFOUND to save $10 on an annual subscription at tpinsights.com or find a link in the show notes. Our hearts go out to the family and our nation over the loss of Justice Ginsburg. She was an amazing leader, role model, and moral giant. Her impact will be felt well beyond her presence with us. If you are a new listener to Founders Unfound, we've got something special for the black founders out there who are still struggling to get recognition. There's another way to get onto our podcast, and it's absolutely free. Just leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or at podchaser.com. If you do this and identify yourself as a black founder, I will read your review in an upcoming episode. So make sure to plug your company and your URL and all the relevant handles. So why not? Podcast episodes live on and on and on. You're basically getting a free ad as a thank you for taking the time to give us a review and support our mission. So be sure to drop your review today. So to that end, I want to give a shout out and a big thank you to Celeste, who gave us five stars and wrote, I love everything about this podcast. There is something powerful about hearing someone share a story that is transparent. I start to see I am not alone. As an entrepreneur, it's important for me to remember that because it can feel like a lonely road. So thank you so much, Dan, for creating this amazing masterpiece. Wow. Thanks so much, Celeste. That was incredible. Celeste has a great show of her own, and I've been on it, called Celeste the Therapist. She has a podcast. She live streams. She's written and published books, all with the goal of helping to empower people and shifting their mindsets. Make sure to check out Celeste at CelesteTheTherapist.com on Twitter at underscore it's me Celeste underscore and simply Celeste the Therapist on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcast. Celeste is C E L E S T E and therapist is T H E R A P I S T. Wasn't that cool? Now is your chance. Head over to Apple or Podchaser and drop us a review. Now on with the episode. Stay safe and hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Founders Unfound, spotlighting the best startups you don't know yet. We bring you stories of exceptional founders from underrepresented backgrounds. This is episode number 20 in our series on founders of African descent. I'm your host, Dan Kihanya. Let's get on it. Today, we have Jim Gibbs, co-founder and CEO of Meter Feeder, a company that predicts parking availability and enables vehicles to pay for parking with no human interaction. Welcome to the show, Jim. We're super excited to have you on. Thanks for making the time. Hi, Dan. Glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, and congratulations on your Steelers uh, 2020 debut win. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. I was uh, busy hiding under a rock writing software, but, you know, I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah, it's the beginning of the season, so it's still early. It's amazing how people just sort of haul, jump into the conversations and the debates and everything around uh, around sports when it kicks back into gear. Absolutely. I, I kind of uh, 
poke my head out every once in a while when I'm like, how are you guys handling parking over at the the stadiums over there? But then besides that, I kind of stay in my hole and, and keep getting back to work. Uh, well, that's a great segue. So why don't we start off with helping the listeners understand exactly what Meter Feeder is all about? Sure. So, I mean, even before COVID, cities were losing billions of dollars trying to price the curb for shared vehicles. So we're talking car to go and Scoot and FedEx, folks like that. We actually made a way for traditional and autonomous vehicles to pay for parking with no human interaction so cities can make money and I can stop getting parking tickets. Yes, the parking ticket is a bane for most people, uh, especially if you live anywhere near a city that somehow is vigilant about that aspect of uh, enforcement. It doesn't make it very much easier that, um, you know, we also have a digital enforcement solution and it's kind of geared towards the small to mid-sized municipality that doesn't have the the budget of someone like a Seattle or a Pittsburgh. Since we're doing making it really easy for the parking enforcement officer to write more parking tickets, we had to make it easier for people to be able to actually pay for parking so they didn't get the parking ticket to begin with. That makes total sense. There's a lot of inefficiencies there for sure. And it seems like somebody's always on the losing end. So it's, it's an awesome concept. But before we dive more into the company, let's hear a little bit about who you are. Are you from Pittsburgh originally? No, I'm actually from New York, all the way out on Long Island, New York. Uh, People generally don't believe me unless I say it like that. Yeah, I ended up coming out to Pittsburgh back in uh, 95, where I went to Carnegie Mellon for a couple of years. But then I found out that I could get a two-bedroom apartment for 500 bucks a month. So essentially came out here for the artificial intelligence and just stayed for the rent. Nice, nice. Well, I know Pittsburgh is is now trending in terms of like one of the more popular cities or, or you know, nicest places to live. So you, you, uh, you picked a good one. Absolutely. So tell us about growing up on Long Island. Um, what was, what was that like? So my father is an interior exterior painter. My mother is, well, she was a a secretary growing up, but they knew that I was into technology. Um, I started uh, writing software back in 1983. So um, it was really just them scraping their pennies together and sent me to places like uh, New York Tech. So when my my friends were out in uh, summer vacation, I was off at programming camp learning how to like build robots and stuff. But then when I got older, it was one of those awkward situations where, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I need to find myself. So it's like, cool, I need to find myself too. So I stopped programming for a summer and I actually got an internship at the Brookhaven National Laboratory where I was working alongside scientists like uh, it was high energy physics. So they had things like uh, LINAC, the alternating gradient synchrotron and the relative physics heavy ion collider and all this other stuff. And uh, yeah, suddenly one of the scientists told me, you're going to be begging for money for the rest of your life if you go into higher energy physics, just be a software developer. So that was pretty much the end of, <laughs> that was the end of me finding myself. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. You could have been the next like Einstein or something. And, uh, and instead he redirected your, uh, your life in another direction. You talked about uh, writing code early. What, what drew you to writing code back in the 80s? when it was not really a thing. Yeah, so I actually saw the movie Tron in the theaters. Yeah, after I was done, I was like, that was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen before in my life. And my mom was like, well, he was a software developer. So I was like, then that's what I want to be, right? And uh, yeah, I, I, I knew that I wanted to get into uh, video game development. And then suddenly I found myself in like medical software and parking and things like that. So what um, did you did you have any friends? I mean, you talked about going to programming camp. Did you have sort of a uh, a loose affiliation or a tribe or anything of other people that you knew that were doing coding and programming? I mean, while I was there. Yeah. Right. The basic friends that you meet at summer camp, they would say awkward things like I can program Pong in my calculator in less than a half hour. I'm like, cool. But then it's like as soon as you leave, you're like, I want to interact with normal people again. So that's pretty much the end of those relationships. Oh, that's funny. Um, and so you talked about going to New York Tech. Um, what? How was that experience? Was that a, a big difference in terms of the focus around STEM that you had been used to prior to that? 
Oh, I mean, absolutely. Because the the thing that you have to remember, I mean, I was still very young. So it's like when you go to programming camp and you're doing things in, you know, hey, in normal life, you're used to using numbers in base 10, right? Then all of a sudden you go back to school the next year and they're like, okay, let's review what's one plus one. And my response being 10 is clearly wrong. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, base 10 is not what programming is based on. <laughs> and base 10 is what we know as sort of the normal, uh, how we how we count. Yeah. Good old Arabic numerals. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. So, I mean, it must have been interesting for your parents, though, to want to encourage this. Again, this is not... You know, the 80s was an interesting time for sure for video games and the introduction of the PC. But again, it wasn't it wasn't like the, you know, sort of powerhouse career track necessarily that we see today. Were they hesitant about that or were they just sort of like whatever Jim wants to do, we're going to support him? They they were supportive, hands down. You know, my older siblings, they wanted to go into music. Looking back, I was like, why? <laughs> but even still, so it was like my everybody else went into music and I went into, you know, tech and software development. So they they gave me the a similar amount of uh, support that they gave my my older siblings. Are you the youngest? I am. Well, wow, there you go. So the parents were already broken in. That's uh, I'm the oldest. So I know by well, the oldest of three. And by the time my youngest brother came around, uh, you know, the parents were like, oh, OK, whatever. Well, the funny thing is, I was also one of those people who saw what my older siblings did wrong and just didn't do it. So, <laughs> Aha, nice, nice. Yes, this is another burden of the older sibling is you got to kind of do everything first and make those mistakes. So tell us about, um, so you, you made this decision to kind of quote unquote officially pursue programming technology. What what drew you to Carnegie Mellon? I mean, it's not someplace within the geographic sphere of Long Island for sure. And what uh, what was that choice about? So there were two main factors and they seem so petty right now, like looking back decades, right? It's 25 years ago. So number one, I needed to rebel, so I needed to get away from my parents, so I couldn't stay local, right? Yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm going to take computer science at MIT, but then my guidance counselor, she was like, oh, yeah, give me all of your applications, I'll go through them, and I'll send them out. I was like, cool, thanks. And she sent out my MIT application a week late. Oh, so yeah, awesome, right? <laughs> so uh i was like oh well i guess i'm going to carnegie mellon then and that was pretty much it that was the decision wow wow you, you have a lot of these little sort of um fork in the road destiny type things in a parallel universe you could have been a physicist at mit i i could have been a physicist at mit but hey who knows i could have been a musician at carnegie mellon too that's true. That's true. Was it was it much of a culture uh, adjustment when you went to Carnegie Mellon? Oh my goodness! Well, it it was just very close to my days at programming camp, right? But it was like it was just nonstop. There was no reprieve, you know, because you have to remember when I'm at New York Tech, I was staying with my aunt and uncle, so I'm sitting here like breakdancing and b-boying and you know getting down and feeling good with the culture, but then turning back around and, you know, when I'm in class, that's when all of a sudden I'm, you know, shifting bits and doing all these other wonderful things, right? Carnegie Mellon, there was no, there was no reprieve, right? It was just build. It was software. It was math. And that was the extent of my life at Carnegie Mellon. Wow. Was there any kind of a social scene that you would be a part of, especially as an African-American? Well, actually, this is I, I don't mean to be telling on people right now, but um, <laughs> we had sleeping bag weekend. Right. So it was when they were trying to bring people who were thinking about going to Carnegie Mellon so that you can like go and see what the classes look like and you know stuff like that. So what I didn't realize was, you know, down the block, they had Pitt, which had they they had a bustling black American community, 
right? So what they did was they had Pitt throw a party with a whole bunch of black people <laughs> during sleeping bag weekend at Carnegie Mellon so that when we all showed up, we were like, oh man, look at all these smart black people. <laughs> so we showed up the first day, we were like, this is, we were duped. It was a bait and switch, hands down, right? Wow. Yeah, I mean, there, there were some some great people, you know, there was uh, spirit, they had, there were a, a lot of folks that had the ability to meet and work with, and there was a lot of uh, hip hop and, you know, underground hip hop culture that I was able to tap into and start to feel a little bit more at home. But um, yeah, it was greatly, greatly, greatly outweighed by, uh, you know, riding printer drivers on a Friday night rather than like going out and spinning on my head. Oh my gosh. Wow. It sounds to me like, you know, I don't know if you've read that book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Outliers, and you know, you have to do the 10,000 hours of uh practice it sounds like you got your ten thousand hours of coding practice in pretty easily between your pre-college and college days yeah well and it made it so weird because when my parents came to pick me up i realized that i lost the ability to speak english well normal english so you know i'm trying to say things and i'm forgetting words like car and ball then suddenly you know, I find someone else, you know, like I, I see a computer science professor or, you know, calculus or another classmate of mine. And suddenly it's just normal. You know, I'm, I'm speaking the normal language of software development and matrix algebra and sorting and searching and combinatorial algorithms and things like that. Right. So, yeah, it was it was just a weird time for my brain to do that shift between like normal hu mere mortal human beings and like actually becoming a living breathing computer wow so you come out of carnegie mellon and 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 sort of what what drew you to sort of whatever was next i definitely needed to make some money <laughs> so i w actually went and tried to get a job and i had two different resumes one was hey my name is jim and i type 70 words a minute and the other one is, hi, my name is Jim, and I know assembly, C++, so on and so forth. So I went going to interview after interview after interview, and everyone is turning me down. I mean, there was just one time I sat down and this guy was interviewing me. I handed him the wrong resume, and he saw me like look at it. My eyes got really big, and I put it back into my bag. And he was like, no, 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 let me see that. He took my uh, resume and was like, can you really do all this? I was like, yeah, sure. So he took me to a computer and using assembly, he was like, let me see you do something. So then I type in a whole bunch of stuff and he was like, this guy's just writing ones and zeros. But then when I hit enter, it just printed Jim is King exclamation point, exclamation point. He was like, are you willing to work for the same amount? Like, cause they were hiring for essentially a uh, real estate assistant. So I was just going to be a receptionist in essence, right? He was like, could you work for $8 an hour and do what you just did? I was like, I would love to. And that's how I got my first job as a software developer. Oh my, that is certainly not a traditional path, I would say. And, uh, and, and I would call it a hack, but I don't know that you could repeat that. I don't think I could because, yeah, the guy that I w was interviewing with, his father was like big time electrical engineering, like one of the staples at Carnegie Mellon University. So I didn't realize that I was talking to this fancy, you know, software guy. And I got to even hang out with his dad a couple of times, you know, to see, you know, some of the things that he was tinkering with. So, yeah, it was it was really serendipitous. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so how long did that last? What what happened next? I stayed there for a while, went back to New York, started working on Wall Street, got a job at the IRS. And then the firm that I was working for, they got shut down by the IRS. I had nothing to do with it. After that, I made enough. I worked at MCI, made enough money to go back to Carnegie Mellon, came back to Pittsburgh, ran out of money again. <laughs> You know, so it was it was a lot of back and forth between uh, here in New York. There was even a time where I was there was this one pizza shop outside a pit called the O, and I used to 
dance outside the O for spare cash so I could do things like buy food and books, right? So <laughs> being a computer science student at uh, Carnegie Mellon is not supposed to be, that's not supposed to be part of the, uh, the experience, <laughs> but here we are, right? So you really dance, like dance dance? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like we would we would go out, put some music out and and we would just start dancing. I was I I used to dance everywhere. I would do dance competitions and everything just so that I can like actually make spare cash. But yeah, so I went from real estate, then I actually built a domain name registrar. Then I uh went into the medical software business. Then I went into, you know, I started my own thing, right? So that was just making websites for people, helping startups get off the ground. After that, started working for a retail company, translated their site to 13 different languages, enabled them to ship to 57 different countries, left there, set up uh, USA Today, uh, helped them uh, redo their entire website when they went from the globe to the blue dot. After that, I went to a company that... I know you from, Dan, uh, where we were doing a lot of um, retail stuff. We were powering a lot of retail sites out there. Yeah. And then after that, then I started Meter Feeder. All right. Well, we're going to get into that story for sure. But first, we will take a short break and be right back with Jim Gibbs of Meter Feeder. Who gets to be called innovative or genius? If we look at the current media landscape today, we often don't see people of color dominating the business or tech news headlines. I'm Sherelle Dorsey, data journalist and founder of The Plug. Our work in reporting has been featured in and used by top names like Vice, The Information, and casting directors at ABC Shark Tank. The Plug cuts out the noise to bring you news, insights, and analysis of trends shaping venture capital, startups, policy, and ecosystems within Black innovation communities. Join our annual pro membership and get exclusive access to our weekly long-form reporting and monthly member calls, which puts you directly at the table with leading innovators and firms around the country. Also access our data libraries of indexes, such as our Black-owned VC firms index or the top 100 Black researchers in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Use code UNFOUND to save $10 on our annual subscription at tpinsights.com. That's T as in the and P as in plug, insights.com. So we're back with Jim Gibbs from Meter Feeder. So we were just about to get started on this wonderful journey that is Meter Feeder. Tell us about how it came about. Where's the idea come from? Sure. So the first idea, I was actually helping someone with another startup idea. And we had lunch and sat down with one of their salespeople. And at the end of lunch, the salesperson reached into her bag and Instead of pulling out money to help chip in, she pulled out a fistful of parking tickets and said, if you guys made a nap to pay for parking, I would use it every day. So I looked at my co-founder, who I've been, at this point, been working with for about 15, 16 years, right? And we just, our eyes just lit up like, well, clearly we can make that, right? Um, you know, put it on the back burner for a little bit, but then we saw that there was a, uh, a hackathon that was, uh, you know, it was for 10,000 bucks. So 300 people entered, we built it, we ended up winning. So yeah, that was essentially the beginning of Meter Feeder. You said that um, you and your co-founder had been working together previous to Meter Feeder. What, uh, how did that relationship emerge? <laughs> this is going back a little bit, right? So you remember when pretty much the only place where you can buy a domain name was through Internic? I do, I do. There was a site called internic.co.uk. And I wrote that domain name registrar. <laughs> so the sad thing is the gentleman who ended up becoming my co-founder, he was the one who had to work support. So he would be up from like three o'clock in the morning till, you know, whenever. When they found out that he was in the US, he was called some of everything like charlatan and this, that and the other. So I was like, clearly <laughs> this guy is, you know, He's resilient is the best way that I could think of putting it, right? Then there was a situation where he just didn't get paid and I didn't get paid. So then we looked at each other and like, I think it's time for us to like build our own stuff, right? And that's when we started to, uh, you know, start getting clients on our own. We actually started renting out the office space across the street from our old office. 
it made things real awkward, but that's how it started. Did you have to change like where you went for lunch and coffee so you wouldn't bump into people? Uh, I'm six foot five, 250 pounds. Nobody's messing with me in my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so, so you two have been working together for a long time. So that's, that's really amazing. And I think that's one of the hallmarks you see from co-founding teams that there is sort of this common thread of either working together, going to school together, being in other activities together. So you get to know the person, you know, what's their strengths, what's their weaknesses, how you work together. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And if something goes wrong, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm not like trying to scheme to fire him. I actually care about him. I care about his family, right? So <laughs> the first thing I think is, is he okay? And it kind of gets rid of one of the, the biggest dysfunctions that I've seen in other organizations, where it's like everyone's trying to one up one another to show their value. If they're, if everyone's trying to demonstrate their value by tearing everybody else around them down, then it's not going to be a healthy environment. So we essentially started the company with that mindset. And then, uh, yeah, everybody else who comes on board, if they can't get down with, you know, I'm genuinely trying to help everybody else, then they don't belong to our organization. That's really great that you were thinking about that. And it's probably a benefit of the fact that you you formed your bond out of semi-rebellion against somebody else's approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but it was really just, you know, we liked being around each other. <laughs> so we wanted to be around people that we liked being around. So it, we kind of just fell into it. There you go. At least it was the priority, right? Which again, I think sometimes people just focus on the X's and O's. So you win this hackathon, but you have sort of, to me, it feels like you've got sort of a nice gig rhythm going, kind of a lifestyle business where you can come in and sort of parachute in and, and take on clients and and build things for them. What was the thing that made the two of you say, you know, we really need to build a separate product company around this. What was, I mean, was it just the hackathon or did you stop and say, let's think about this. Is this, was that just fun? We put $10,000 in our pocket, but, but let's move on. Or was it like, yeah, this, this is a potential for a really big business. We knew that people were spending over a hundred billion dollars for parking payments. Right. So we knew it was a big market. I mean, to be honest, the, the point where we were like, we should probably take this serious <laughs> is when we were accepted Y Combinator. I, I realized that so many people put a lot of stress into getting into accelerators and things like that. But it was almost like I felt like we were going to do it no matter what, right? When we applied, just the application process itself made me ask questions about the company, about the business. And it was during that process where I was like, Hey, Dan, I, I think, well, Dan's my co-founder's name. Hey, Dan, I think we actually need to try that this is actually a thing that we can do in order to build generational wealth, right? And um, we were right. And so when, when was that? When was Y Combinator? That was 2016. They keep track of like cohorts. What, what number cohort was that? I'm not sure. <laughs> You're making me do math. I think it's like eight, nine, ten, somewhere on there. Yeah, it was it was pretty uh, relatively early um, in the whole arc of things. What was what was that experience like? It's bizarre because you know you, you you do things like watch videos on how to start a startup, and then all of a sudden they're like standing right next to you, and they're way shorter than they look on YouTube, right? The old the old Tom Cruise Sylvester Stallone uh, uh, trick. Yeah, it was it was great. Because all the people that you just never even thought about, right? Like, I remember talking to this one guy. I was like, oh, nice to meet you, so on and so forth. So what brings you here? He was like, oh, yeah, I wrote Gmail. I'm like, you never even think about the person who wrote Gmail, like, ever. <laughs> You just assume Gmail's a thing that Google put out there, and as a company, they just magically encanted it, and now it's on the internet. So uh, <laughs> being able to meet the guy who uh, built the product that eventually became Gmail was was astounding. I, I think that that was, that was one of those times where meeting 
the Airbnb guys and talking about when their company was smaller than ours. It was really, really interesting and helped me get my mind wrapped around like this is possible. It may be difficult and our journey may look significantly different than everyone else's, but it is absolutely possible. That's cool. I mean, I think that's part of the, the value add is that they help you figure out, you know, is there a there there and where's the momentum and, and kind of put structure around that. Do you participate in alumni network or, you know, that's kind of one of their claims to fame is that they have sort of the secret handshake that uh, all the Y Combinator alums have and, and help each other and that kind of thing. There are, there are a few companies that we're, you know, keeping an eye on and we're keeping in contact with definitely to help one another out, but take it one step further. I personally have a strong conviction to helping other black founders at least catch up to where I am. Right. So being able to use those like that network in order to influence the next generation of entrepreneurs, not only from a business level, but sort of the social level as well. Tell us a little bit more about how Meteor Feeder works. So I imagine there's it's got two sides to it. There's sort of the municipalities or the payees, I suppose, who um, who take in parking fees, and then you've got the payers, the folks who you know pay for parking. How do you get set up? Do you have to work with a specific municipality first and get implemented with them, or you start with payers and then go um, where they? want to park or how does that work we generally start with the city first you also have a, an app to pay for parking but even still we go in there they're like i don't understand this pay by vehicle mindset so then we sort of roll in with just the app and they're like okay i get this and we're like cool we go out we sell the fleets fleets are super easy to sell because essentially we just say hey do you want to stop getting parking tickets? And then they sign up to get their fleet management solution, put in their payment information, and then they're ready to go. Suddenly, the city, they start to understand what the pay by vehicle thing is just because it looks exactly like the app payments are. So it's like being able to speak the language of the city, starting where they understand, and then moving into the the mindset of the vehicles paying for themselves. That's awesome. And and on the city side, is there is it a software solution or a hardware solution or a combination or how does that work? We are software guys. <laughs> so it is a completely software solution. I mean, even as far as the fleets are concerned, we don't do any hardware. We we just don't want to compete with all of these amazing companies that are already in the space. So yeah, I mean, whatever vehicle or devices that they're already using, we have a, a great team of software guys and we just build out any sort of uh, integration that we need. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Nice. And I, I would imagine that there's probably a handful of hardware folks out there that have a pretty good footprint across the market at this point. Absolutely. And from a fleet, so what's an example of a fleet that might be either that's a customer or might be a potential customer. If, if you think about like a, a utility company, if it's like Acme Electricity, normally they have a, a fleet management solution inside. And essentially, instead of trying to negotiate with the city and trying to get better deals, they can just pay for what they use, right? So we can do things from rental car companies, mobility solutions, to delivery companies, all sorts of things in order to make sure that people don't get parking tickets. And cities are okay with that because what we've heard resoundingly is that the cities want to foster a culture of compliance. I mean, as authoritarian, <laughs> as scary as that might sound, they would prefer to not give people parking tickets because that just turns into a fight. Yeah, and I would imagine that while parking tickets generate revenue, there's probably this hole, right, where, you know, people are paying or not paying for parking, but also not getting a ticket for whatever reasons, the compliance is 100%, right? And so, and then from a fleet point of view, probably at the end of the day, it's cheaper to just do 100% pay parking than to 
pay, you know, 30% of the time for the parking and then have to pay, you know, 25% of the time, big tickets that are going to be, you know, whatever, a hundred times X, the cost of what the parking would have been. Yeah, exactly. And then you start to think about, you know, delivery companies in New York city got like a hundred million dollars in parking tickets. So just imagine having to do all the data entry for all of those parking tickets and then turn back around and say, not guilty to every single one. So now you have to hire legal <laughs> in order to fight it. And then you have the city who's super upset because now they their courts are overflowed. So yeah, it, it's a mess. <laughs> it's pretty bad. So um, yeah, I'm glad to be able to essentially solve a pain point on both sides of the aisle. That's pretty cool. And so the no human rea- interaction and the no app, I mean, so basically it's all sort of kind of GPS as soon as the car or vehicle enters into some sort of a, a geofence that's within a certain distance of the the pain meter, then it's just automatic. Yep, that's that's it. I mean, once the the person goes and parks and turns their vehicle off, you know, they send us the latitude, longitude, engine state, timestamp. In which case, we say, "Cool, the vehicle's off. They probably want to start paying for parking," and then. We start the the meter running, and then when they turn their vehicle on, drive away, and uh, we assume that they want to stop paying for parking, and then that's it. Wow, that's cool. I mean, you make it sound so simple, but I'm sure behind the scenes it's not simple, and it is profound, right? I mean, even from an efficiency standpoint, right, like not having to worry about even dealing with an app, right? I mean, even if it's simple and straightforward, it's, you know, 20, 30 seconds up to maybe a minute and a half or two minutes of data entry or or you know, what sector am I in and things like that. And so if you're in a you know situation where those kind of time, you know, sort of impacts, like if you're delivering packages, which is pro- probably like a 45 second thing, if you're just dropping them off somewhere, right? Now you're adding. You're not adding a couple of minutes because they're just not going to pay for it, <laughs> right? Yeah, because you have to think about it, right? It's like if you have a thousand delivery people, are you going to put your credit card information on every one of their phones? So, yeah, they're just like, I'm just going to get the ticket. And they just park anywhere that they want to. Interesting. So tell us a little bit about, like where you're at now and what's sort of your big vision for the company. I mean, how big could this be? And do you have sort of a, you know, a goal in mind of, of where you want the company to go? As a red-blooded human being, I want <laughs> my vision for the company is I want people to make parking so easy that no one ever gets another parking ticket. That is my vision. I'm talking directly to me when I say that. I hope I never get another parking ticket ever again. (laughs) But I hope that on everyone else as well. As far as the actual vision for the company, we want to make sure that if you look at the bigger picture, we need better mobility. I mean, the place where our office is, it's in Braddock, Pennsylvania. The median household income is $24,000 a year. They need to get to work. They need to be able to travel in order to get better work. In order to do that, there needs to be better mobility solutions. So if we can help cities understand, just usher in a brand new era of mobility, I feel like the whole world would be a better place. I totally agree with you. And mobility is going to change dramatically over the next 10, 20, 50 years. We just had our last episode was with somebody who was working with the dollar vans, if you can remember those from New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's trying to um, basically Uberize those. And uh, and so, yeah, mobility is going to change pretty dramatically. And we haven't even talked about autonomous vehicles. I'm sure they're a part of your roadmap down the road as well. Absolutely. I mean, so far, all of the people that we've spoken to from <laughs> in, in the autonomous vehicle side, they're like, I think we have it figured out. And then I have one conversation with them and their response is, we don't have it figured out. I'm like, okay, cool. We're here for you when you're ready for us. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's good. You're ahead of the curve. So we're going to take another short break and be right back with Jim Gibbs of Meter Feeder. Who gets to be called innovative or genius? If we look at the current media landscape today, we often don't see people of color dominating the business or tech news headlines. I'm Sherelle Dorsey, data journalist and founder of The Plug. 
Our work in reporting has been featured in and used by top names like Vice, The Information, and casting directors at ABC Shark Tank. The plug cuts out the noise to bring you news, insights, and analysis of trends shaping venture capital, startups, policy, and ecosystems within Black innovation communities. Join our annual pro membership and get exclusive access to our weekly long-form reporting and monthly member calls, which puts you directly at the table with leading innovators and firms around the country. Also access our data libraries of indexes, such as our Black-owned VC firms index or the top 100 Black researchers in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Use code UNFOUND to save $10 on our annual subscription at tpinsights.com. That's T as in the and P as in plug, insights.com. So we're back with Jim Gibbs. So Jim, uh, let's talk a little bit about fundraising. Have you raised money for Meter Feeder? Do you plan on raising money? What's that experience been for you? Yes, we have raised money. (laughs) We have not raised much money, but we have successfully raised some money. The the experience is, is always interesting. A lot of it has to do with what's in vogue for the time being. For example, um, when people start talking about doing like diverse investments, it actually wasn't until recently where black people were considered a part of diversity. Now that people are saying, oh, black people have a hard time raising, folks actually look at me as someone who might actually be onto something. It sounds kind of weird. There's been a number of people who have talked about me being in parking and saying, hey, that's like not a traditionally black problem. You know, so like when you talk about like black problems, like, oh, hair salons, barbershops, you know, stuff like that. Like, how are you going to run this jitney? And uh, like, I get it. But my issue is that I have a wife and five kids and there's zero chance of me ever having change in my pockets. So I'm not able to pay for parking. Yeah, you're, I, I'd hate to see a grocery bill, man. Jeez. Five boys. Man, wow. But yeah, the, the idea is being able to speak to folks and have them not immediately just doubt me. I mean, I've been doing software for a very long time. I've been building for a very long time. So now that Black Tech Twitter is a thing, now that there there's all of these new wave of entrepreneurs now people have the ability to actually look and see what i'm doing and what i'm building and kind of understand and have confidence in me and the mission in order to start backing it wow that's interesting so do you feel do you feel like it's a benefit now that this lens is sort of opened up as you say uh, around um, black entrepreneurs or do you find it sort of frustrating that it's like I'm still the same person and a company still the same thing. Why is the, why is it different now? It's frustrating, but the best thing that I could possibly do, right? If they're trying to get 10 X from everyone else, if I can get 20 X, 50 X, hundred X, thousand X, then the next time they see a black person walking down the street that says that they've been writing software for the last 36 years of their life, maybe, just maybe, (laughs) they'll give that person a shot. Essentially, I don't care what the reason is, and I realize that this is is somewhat controversial. I don't care what the reason is, but I feel like it's my duty to help them realize that they made the right decision And they should look at my brothers and sisters like they are actual human beings and give them the opportunity as well. That's profound. And I I agree with that 100% that um, I've had these discussions with other folks. Like, it's not just about representing. It's also about normalizing, right? I mean, there's people who come from certain backgrounds where their background isn't even brought up. It's not even mentioned it's it's not even in somebody's subconscious right they're just evaluating that person based upon what's in front of them around the business opportunity or the investment opportunity and um and so i think it's a great opportunity to be a successful startup uh, and for those to start to string together in a way that people say oh yeah this is not a outlier this is not a one-off and so I, I love that you want to wear that mantle. That's that's amazing. That's great. It's a heavy burden to bear, but it's hilarious because like I found a number of other people 
who are also bearing the same weight. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things. After we're all like cashed out and have written our books, we could just be like, cool. <laughs> Hopefully for the next group of people, they find it way easier, even from the, the software perspective into the entrepreneurship perspective. Uh, I, I've consistently been hit with doubt. It, it's really just, I, I see it as my job to make sure that, you know, the next group of folks do not have to go through the same thing that I have to go through. That's awesome. Uh, so thank you, first of all. So <laughs> one of the things you mentioned, though, and in the last segment was this idea of helping other Black founders. I'm curious, are there are there kind of specific ways that you try to do that? And I guess a follow-up to that would be, were there people who helped you along the way? My uncle is the one who got me hooked up with programming. So that's... That's how long ago. That's how it started, <laughs> right? You have people like uh, this one lady. Her name is Rihanna Renee Flack, right? She's the one who got me into the Brookhaven National Laboratory. So there's, it's just been consistent. Consistently throughout my life, there's been people who have been dropped into my life who essentially let me know that they've been fighting for me and I better take advantage. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of my job to, to do that for the next group of folks. And sort of pay it forward, I guess. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, hopefully I'll get to the point where I can start investing and it wouldn't even be paying forward. It'd be beneficial to me because I'll be making all this money from all these amazing black people that everybody who is underestimating. That's right. That's right. And I, I've, I've had this discussion with a few investors and I say, you know, there's there's a it's like there's a draft out there and there's a bunch of folks that are ready to be picked and, um, you know, if I were in their shoes, I'd say, I want all the best ones. I want to be greedy. I want to, I want to be, I want, I want to have a monopoly of all the best talent out there. Um, and so go hard at it. So you're totally right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that we're starting to see more GPs out there, more black GPs. You got folks like Charles Hudson, Arlen Hamilton, um, the, the Brookings with their uh, light shift capital closing $50 million. Shout out to them. I, I think that there's not nearly enough money. We say, yay, $50 million, but you know, there are funds that would invest a million dollars a week. They were $50 million funds. So they raise one fund every year and invest a million dollars in a new startup every week. Comparatively speaking, <laughs> we're, we're still in that phase of, I like to talk to about the black mom who's like, go to the store, get some milk. And it hands you a dollar. It's like, uh, Ma, this is enough. Well, make it enough. Oh, okay. You know, so we're, we're still not in that phase where we can like be comfortable. We still need to be vigilant. We still need to pinch pennies and we still need to work our butts off. So, um, so tell me, I'm, I'm curious. So you've set up shop in Pittsburgh. Um, you must've gone to the Valley at least for a little while with OIC. What made you decide to anchor your company in Pittsburgh? I see. I have a three- bedroom house, a two-car garage, big old kitchen, walk-in closet, enough land to grow food, chickens, all this other crazy stuff. And I am paying mortgage with all of my insurances and stuff like that. It comes out to about uh, $1,024 a month. Now, let's compare that to me living in Sunnyvale, staying with my co-founder, love the man dearly, don't want to live with them. <laughs> but it was a two bedroom apartment the size of my downstairs. And yeah, it looks like it hadn't been updated since Miami Vice. I was paying four thousand dollars a month. <laughs> you know? So and that was that was a discount. She gave me a discount because we we were paying early. So it's it's just a way for us to keep burn obnoxiously low and you know, stay focused and build all the software that we need to, right? I, I think the best way to think about it is like, we're sort of like Gusto. Gusto had to go from state to state to do all the state regulations, right? Tell people what Gusto is for those who don't know. Sure. So Gusto is, in my opinion, from what I've seen, is one of the best and easiest ways to manage your HR, right? So paying hiring, handling your, your 1099s, your documentation, things like that. So 
there's a lot of things that you have to do on the federal level, from the state level, so on and so forth. So there's really no reason for me to be doing that in a place where I'm spending $4,000 a month. I might as well get my 1,000 square foot office for 650 bucks a month, newly renovated, and sit down and get that stuff taken care of and get that stuff done. So now that the, the integrations are starting to finish up, now we can start taking advantage of all that effort that we put in. And it's as low cost as we could have made it. Nice. Hey, here's a question. Tell us uh, something about the Pittsburgh startup ecosystem that we may not know. I'll bring it back to uh, YC. They were telling me, don't move back to Pittsburgh because there are no examples of a billion dollar company. They were like, what was the last billion dollar company? I was like, well, there was four systems and there were free markets. And they're like, I've never heard of those. They were in like 2004. So now we have Duolingo. So that is, that is essentially the best thing that I can think of as far as things that are going on in the Pittsburgh scene. Oh, wow. And I imagine with Carnegie Mellon there and to some degree Pitt, I mean, the, the talent opportunity, I know Google has a big shop there. There must be a good amount of talent that you, you can use to grow with in terms of hiring, at least on the tech side. Dan, I'm 100% serious. I am not lying a pound. I hired somebody at Arby's. At Arby's? From Arby's. He was working behind the counter. He cracked a JavaScript joke. I hired him. <laughs> That's an awesome story. <laughs> They're literally everywhere. I, I mean, like you find programmers everywhere in Pittsburgh. It's, it's just, you know, where are you going to go? Right. That's sort of the downside. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm excited to be part of the, the people who are building out the startup ecosystem so that these developers don't have to work at Arby's. They can actually come and work for new companies. There you go. There you go. That's an underappreciated aspect of ecosystems that are outside the valley. And that definitely makes sense when you've got sort of those anchor universities. So our time is growing short. Unfortunately, this is fun. But one, one question we like to ask is, if you could go back to the pre-startup version of yourself, so let me, let's just say, I guess, before the hackathon, and give that gym some advice about what to expect, what to look out for, what not to do in the journey that came afterwards, what advice would you give that, Jim? I, I think that at the end of the day, it is the two main things that I would say is don't feel bad. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Yes, the game is rigged. Don't feel bad for yourself. And the other thing is your wife is more important than you can imagine treat her as such and have her be a part because if she doesn't feel like she's a part of it then the startup consumes you and if she's not a part of the startup then she's not a part of you i'm not my startup however it, it's it's just one of those things where it's easy to feel unimportant and that is the last thing that i need to do to the mother of my five boys. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was just reading something where somebody wrote, they were a founder and they said, my spouse was my first co-founder and I've had to look at it from that perspective. They're invested in this right alongside me. So that's a great point. Absolutely. I still can't get over five boys, man. Yeesh. It's, it's awesome, but it, uh, it just makes me tired thinking about it. As we wrap up here, um, why don't you tell the folks, um, how can they find out more information about Meter Feeder or uh, if there's ways to get in touch with you, if you have social media handles, what, what do you want to share with the audience? Sure. So actually our winnings from the hackathon is we went out and bought the domain name www.meterfeeder.com. So uh, that's where you find us online. Our Twitter handle is meterfeeder. Go figure. But you can find me at my old b-boy name at Hezo, H-E-E-Z-O. We're, we're always around and we're trying to help people not get parking tickets. So reach out to us if you do, and we're not going to pay it for you, but uh, at least we can go and nag the people who gave it to you and see if we can make it a little bit easier for you to pay for parking. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jim. We'd like to thank our guest, Jim Gibbs, and our sponsor, The Plug. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or simply go to foundersunfound.com. 
forward slash listen to. That's listen T-O. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram or LinkedIn at Founders Unfound. This podcast was produced by Dan Quijana. Editing and production by Georgia Garcia Moreno, Albert Holguin, and Caitlin Limber. Social media and other promotion by Umama Marzouk and Anisha Barnett. Our music was composed by Michael Quijana. I am Dan Quijana, and you've been listening to Founders Unfound.